Hey there, I'm Nate Regeer, CEO and founding partner of Next Element Consulting. We're a global leadership firm specializing in communication and conflict skills for leaders. Today on Dov Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, we're going to be talking about drama, all the ways in which conflict can go south and get negative, and then we're going to talk about a positive counterpart, how you can put the positive power of conflict to work and create amazing breakthrough results. Congratulations! You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, is the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. He's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of leadership excellence. Thank you for joining us here on this episode of Dov Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives, part of the Full Monty interview series, where today we're going to look at the number one fear human beings have, and no, it's not public speaking, and why, if you don't look at it, develop skills around it, you will ultimately fail as a leader. If you're a new listener, a new viewer, thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in, we're about to go full Monty. If you're a regular listener, then I want to say a big thank you to you because you've made us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners. We are honored and grateful to be cited by Inc. Magazine as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. And GNA also cited us as the top 10 podcast for HR pros and managers. Thank you for sharing the show with everyone you know. Remember, we always need your help in staying relevant, so please get over to iTunes, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. Watching and listening to this show, you are either a high-level executive, an entrepreneur, a sales leader, or a leader at least in some capacity. And as a leader, you know that sometimes leadership can feel like you are the teacher in the schoolyard trying to keep the bullies away from the small kids. There again, as a leader, there's a pretty good chance that you've been, at least at times, fighting others to get your own ideas heard or to get your ideas implemented. Those fights can be tough, and many don't feel that they have it in them. But what if there's a way to have conflict without casualties? Our guest today is one of the world's leading experts on how to do healthy conflict. Dr. Nate Rieger is the co-founder, owner, and CEO of, the Next, of Next Element, a global advisory firm specializing in building cultures of compassionate accountability. A former practicing psychologist, Dr. Nate Rieger is an expert in social, emotional intelligence and leadership, positive conflict, neuropsychology, group dynamics, interpersonal and leadership communication, organizational development, team building, and change management. He's an international advisor certified in way more things than I could possibly tell you. <laughs> and, and he's also the author of two books. One is Beyond Drama, and his latest is this one called Conflict Without Casualties. Make sure you get it. Let's put your hands together and welcome Mr. Nate Rieger. Woo! <laughs> Crowd goes wild. Thank you Good very much. You, Thank you, Dom. It's great to be on the show. I'm, I'm blushing. I don't know if you can all see that, but thank you for that kind introduction. Well, as you can see, you, just the, the ambience of your personality has set car alarms off in the background. I don't know if you can hear those, but I can hear them. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot of pressure here on you, man, to really knock God. you out of the park. <laughs> it's good to have you on, mate. But, you know, this, you know, I said right in the opening there that, you know, we have this rumor that the number one fear people face is public speaking. But I have a, a public speaking academy. We have the Authentic Speaker Academy for Leadership. And I've gotten people who are terrified of speaking over it to become exceptional speakers. Right. But challenging those people to do conflict, that's something in a whole other level. Because most of us have never learned healthy conflict. Why do you why why do you think this? I I believe there's a crisis in this sense uh, of that because conflict is so repressed within us that it, the other side of it is it explodes. Tell us tell us your experience of how you got into this world of creating healthy conflict. 
Well, you're right. People, it's fascinating. We ask people all the time, when I say the word conflict, what comes to mind? And, you know, the most typical things people will say is, oh, no, run away. People get hurt. Uh, Bad things happen. And when we explore a little deeper, usually people have those associations because of experiences in their past where conflict has resulted in casualties. Mm -hmm. The other day I went on Google and I started Googling the word conflict. And you know how Google will, will populate with common phrases that go with the word. And what I noticed is the top three words that are affiliated with conflict on Google are reduction, management, and mediation. So what does that say about the word conflict? Clearly, conflict has a bad rap. Like Absolutely. we're supposed to manage it, mediate it, reduce it. And, and I think so we have this terrible uh, – conflict's got a bad rap and we got to yeah. change that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting uh, for me. I mean I, I will – when people talk – I talk about – conflict with people and they'll say that but it's easier for you you know because you're more assertive and all the rest of it and I go listen I may look like I'm good at conflict I don't like conflict and unhealthy conflict any more than anybody else I really quite dislike it but I understand the necessity of it and I understand that it doesn't have to be the way it the way we've seen it now you just said you know we've got a reference point we've got how do we get leaders who who you're going to like the leaders you work with how do you get them to grasp that that is a bias that that, that they have a bias based on and understandably based on their previous experiences how do you get them to understand that and that there might actually be another way because conflict may look like a punch in the head to that person well i think the first thing is exactly what you said is no it doesn't get easy it's never fun it's always uncomfortable uncomfortable. And I think it has to do with this basic human, it's, it's human nature that when, when the chips are down, when, when we're at odds with somebody, we, we go to this default position of wanting to be justified. Mm -hmm. And so conflict that destroys is conflict where people are seeking justification. And why would we seek to be justified unless we were doing things that we knew weren't healthy and weren't, weren't good. There's no need to justify healthy behavior, good behavior. So I think fighting that human natural urge to be justified, it never goes away. It's who we are. We just become more skilled in using it and and figuring out ways to to use that gap, that's that energy of that gap that's created between behaviors and expectations or wants and needs and negotiate that energy differently. Yeah, it, it's, it is. It, it's really fascinating. Um, I mean, when we when you, when I think about people in general, you know, there are people who appear to be aggressive. There are appear who there are people who be, appear to be quiet. Um, I was having uh, working with a, a CEO yesterday, um, and he's you know he's very successful. He does great stuff, but definitely has a problem with conflict. And I said, how do you think people would describe you? You know, just upon meeting you, you know, and he described himself as centered and calm and blah, blah, blah. And I, you know, and he went through these whole things. And I said, so if you go into a conflict, how does that mess with your image? And he was like, like shocked that I even considered that. So part of it is about identification of who we are and that we don't want to get into something that's going to mess with our image. Right. So that's on one side of it. And so what I and I challenged him on this. Talk to us, because I think this is an important piece around the passive aggressive leader who doesn't do conflict directly, but does passive aggressive. Right. Because I think you've got to, and I need you to help uh, our listeners views out by explaining passive aggressive because it's a term yeah. that's thrown around, but most people don't understand it. Yeah. Well, I, l- let's break down co- negative conflict. It, it's sure. not a mystery. We can understand it. And, and there's a model that I share in my book. We didn't develop it. It was developed by a great psychiatrist by the name of Stephen Cartman. And this, it's, the, it's this model called the drama triangle. And it, it outlines elegantly and beautifully the behavioral roles that we play and the ways in which we interact with one another in distress. But, but to your point, what, what I like the most about this model is it, it identifies the underlying belief systems that we're attempting to justify when we want to appear a certain way with people. So for example, um, and people may play one or more of these roles on any given day. 
um, the role of the persecutor is the ro- is the person that goes on the attack and blames and gets critical and 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 it's always someone else's fault. It's always someone else's problem because beneath the surface, their belief system is, "I'm okay. You're not okay. Therefore, it is okay to mistreat you." And it's all very self-justifying and makes rational sense in their own mind. So they can be an absolute ogre all day long and still sleep at night. Because I think you need to stop there for people- a minute, Nate, because that is, that is powerful and important because I think that people have got to grasp that this is what's actually going on the world stage today, not just in the boardroom, yeah. not just in the bedroom, yeah. but on the world stage. So please give us yeah. that piece again. I want people to really grasp that piece. Okay. The, the persecutor role, the first of the three, they mm-hmm. adopt the attitude. They change, they change their belief inside to say, I'm okay. You're not okay. Therefore, it is okay to attack and blame and mistreat and criticize you. That way, they can behave in very unethical and inappropriate and harmful ways, and they can still sleep at night because the person deserved it. And so we can see evidence of this behavioral role when people say things like, well, sometimes you just have to show them who's boss. Or, you know, they're never going to learn until you, um, until you bring the hammer down. Or um, nobody else is putting America first, so we're not going to play. Right. Um, and, and those are the kinds of all or nothing ultimatums where I'm the good guy, you're the bad guy. And that's only one of the three roles. Yeah, so, I want to address that one there because I think this is a very important piece. Um, because anytime we, you know, you know, my background is in psychology too, but anytime we move into the space of absolutes, as you just stated, all or nothing, um, then the egoic mind is embedded in being right. And as soon as I'm right and you're wrong, and there is no percentage of shift, I was like, absolutely, you're just wrong and I'm just right. Then... That's the moment of dehumanization. That's the moment right. where I can say you're a lesser being and I can drone bomb you. I can throw you in jail. I can do horrendous things to you. I can speak to you in any yeah. way that I feel de- I deem okay because, as you said, you deserved it. Yeah, yeah. And this is because I think that, you know, I know the three positions you're going to talk about, but I think that this one's a very important one because it's with all of them, we have to self-monitor that moment of, you know, I, I said I mean, in the, in the, in, when I'm working with an executive team, I say, one of the things I say is, listen, there are moments when I'm sure my wife looks at me and thinks I'm completely insane and totally and absolutely wrong. And there are moments when that works the other way around. No right. doubt about it. Right. My job it, it, when I'm doing that is to stop and say, where might some part of this be, be on me? Right. Even if it seems crazy, when and that getting out of that absolute thinking that is that's a, that's a real challenge for a lot of people, Nate. It's a real challenge because I there is only one existential position in life, which is I'm okay, you're okay. Mm-hmm. That's the only existential position. A- any other position we take is behavioral, where we start to to decide who's okay and who isn't. And so the persecutor adopts what's called positional okayness. They take a position, I'm okay, you're not. And once I take a position, I'm invested in defending it. And everything I do has to prove the position is right. And that's why it is so very difficult to negotiate a reason with people that have taken a position on okayness. That yeah. is, I mean, I, I think right there we could stop the show and if people just got that. If they actually, seriously, if people could get yeah. that alone, like I know you, this is a great book and it's packed with – tons of powerful information and knowledge and and techniques and strategies. But that for me is like, let's ring the bell right there and just go, okay, just go away and practice that. Don't, you have to, you don't have to do it perfectly, but just practice that alone. It could change so many things. Walk us through the next, the next part of the triangle. The next role is called the role of the victim and the victim adopts when things go go bad, they adopt the exact opposite belief, which is I'm not okay, you are okay, so therefore it is okay for you to mistreat me, violate my boundaries, talk down to me, give me ultimatums, force me to do things. And so the victim's behavior tends to be second-guessing themselves, assuming they're wrong all the time, 
um, taking one for the team in a way that completely undermines their own boundaries and and dignity. And so the belief system of the victim is a perfect counterpart for the belief system of the persecutor. So Absolutely. persecutors are looking for victims and victims are looking for persecutors. And it goes like this mm-hmm. because their belief systems match. And so when we do our more in-depth behavioral training, we, we, te- we teach people how to recognize recruitment, subtle recruitment recruiting strategies for how a victim maybe recruits a a persecutor. Here's one example. If I start a sentence like this, you know, this may sound stupid, but (laughs) I am recruiting, I'm recruiting a persecutor. But yet how often is that how we start conversations and meetings? Or um, how about this one? If everyone's okay with it, maybe we could take a break. That's a complete recruitment for a persecutor to say, your needs don't matter. Shut up and toughen up and stick it out. Nobody needs a break. Um, so those are two of the three roles, and they, they dance all the time. Absolutely. But, but there's a third role, and this third role is even more insidious, and it's called the role of the rescuer. Mm-hmm. The rescuer is the one that makes a living stroking their ego by fixing everyone else's problems except for their own. And the – the rescuer's belief system is very insidious because it's not positional. Here's their belief. I'm okay, and you would be okay if you would let me fix you and be so grateful. And so it's like they give you a chance to step up and, and, and be so grateful and let them save you so that they can feel great and create dependence. And that's very, that's very personal for me because I'm in the consulting training business. And I'll tell you what, the consulting industry makes a living off of rescuing their clients, creating dependence, and then when things don't turn well, somebody's gonna turn on the other one and someone's gonna be the rescuer and someone's gonna be the victim. And it doesn't go well. Uh, usually it ends in the client looking for another flavor of the month next year. So these are... You know, uh, there's a there's a similar triangle: uh, hero, victim, martyr. Victim, martyr. They yeah, fall yeah, yeah. into the same thing, and again, because of our background in psychology. But you know, it's really interesting to me that the um, <clears throat> what I see in each one of these positions is a horrible lack of self worth. So, in the first position of the persecutor. The external person looking in thinks, oh, they've got tons of self-esteem and some, tons of self-worth because they just roll over everybody and shit doesn't get on them. And they're, they're, right. you know. But actually, they have very low self-worth. You don't need to beat the crap out of somebody if you haven't got low self-worth. The, the, right. the victim position, again, is a very low self-worth. Um, and, you know, as you said, that passiveness and, and, the, and recruiting of people to beat them up. And then that other side, which, you know, you and I come from, yeah, yeah. because it's the business. I mean, I, I think that psychology <laughs> teaches you to be a freaking rescuer. It's one of the reasons oh, yeah, I got Oh, yeah, I out. was. I was taught that way. Absolutely. In my training. Right? Looking at people yeah. like they were broken. Uh, and it took yeah. me years, years to go, I don't work with broken people. Why? Because if there are any, there are few, and I'm not the guy for them. Everybody's already okay. They're already great. They've got a pile of shit that's piled on top of their, their greatness, and we can leave that off, but they're already whole. Yeah. But in that rescuer role, I know how much I was feeding my ego. I know how much, yep. and yep. I yep. know how often I got bit in the ass because yeah. I couldn't fix. Because the, the, the thing, and this is important for leaders to understand, is if you're operating out of that, you have to, this is where it falls down, in particularly in romantic relationships. So you're going to rescue somebody who is a victim, and you're going to rescue them, and you're going to build them up. Well, if you succeed in doing that, what are they going to do? They don't need you anymore. They're going to walk If up, you succeed, up. then you've lost purpose in life. So exactly. it's important that you keep them. And, and this is why I often say the victim in this triangle is actually the most powerful, because by remaining broken... They can be attacked by the persecutor, and they can be saved by the rescuer. And by doing that, they're able to commandeer unbelievable amounts of energy in a system. And so we often look at the victims and say, oh, poor them, poor them, poor them. They're, and I, I'm not saying that this is on purpose, but victims are able to really suck in both other roles. And uh, you know, I was, I was taught as a, as a – literally as a psychologist, these are lines I was taught to write in my therapy notes – client was resistant to treatment recommendations. What does yeah. that say? 
I'm the expert. I know best. I tried, but the client was resistant, so therefore it's their fault that they're not getting better. Yeah. And that way I could sleep good at night and not have to face the fact that maybe I didn't connect with that person. Maybe I was never sent to say them, and maybe they weren't broken to start with. Um, but I just yeah. think you just said something that's vitally important. You know, I, I used to say years ago that some of the best therapists in the world have never done any, never done any training. Um, the, and I, you would say, you know, it's your, it's your, it's your, your friend's grandmother. It, it's, it's your best friend's dad who yeah. may have been a yeah, terrible yeah, yeah. dad to your best friend. Yeah. And they go, well, why? And I said, because of their willingness to connect the greatest therapy in the world is connection you know uh, you know uh, this this stuff around all the misconcepts of addiction and what they really are but what it really is yeah. about is connection and community and the the greatest therapeutic process and it's what you do in the boardroom is what i do with the executives is let's get you guys to connect let's get you to peel back the layers and, and reveal yourselves and connect and right. then when conflict comes up, which it will, I'm not seeing you on the pedestal or I'm not seeing you down there as the victim. Yeah. This is powerful well, and, work, mate. It's important. Thank you. Thank you. And and what this drama triangle, this these dynamics reveal is that when we are in distress and in conflict in an unhealthy conflict, our goal is to feel justified. And this whole notion of worthlessness that you shared is so profound because every role has now decided my value is externally determined. Mm -hmm. So the persecutor says, I'm worthwhile in as much as I can put you below me. Um, and the victim is the opposite. And the rescuer says, I'm worthwhile in as much as I can fix you. And so everybody's worthiness is now defined by something that it was never our job to do. And we were okay to start with. So, so let, let, let's – I know you've probably got a lot more you want to get into, but I just okay. want to go, go into each of these for a moment sure. because I'm certain that one of our you know, our viewer, our listener is looking at one of those positions and going, shit, yeah, you know what? I really do play the victim or, ooh, you know what? I'm really a rescuer or, you know what? Maybe not all the time, but I can definitely step into that persecutor role. Can you walk us through – a practicality that anybody could do in any one of those three roles to, to at least pause, at least, yeah. you know, at least create I some will. think process. Yeah. Yes. We've identified what are called leading indicators. How do I know I'm slipping off? And it's just like the bumpers, the, the rumble strips on the side of the road. Uh, if I recognize them, I know what they mean. No harm, no foul. I can redirect. If I ignore them or miss them, next thing I'm in a ditch, I'm hitting a tree, I'm hitting another car. And so the, when we're full on playing these roles in drama, there's a lot of damage. But here are the leading indicators. If if victim is your go-to role in drama, the leading indicator is what we call giving in. And giving in is a very subtle pr process. This is not about healthy um, collaboration and compromise. Giving in is about I know deep down inside that the choice I'm making or the behavior I'm allowing is chipping away at my soul. So maybe, you know, I have three daughters and one of the things I'm helping them appreciate is, is if, if your boyfriend asks you or your friend asks you to do something and your gut says it's not okay, but you don't speak up and you don't say that, it's giving in in a, in a very small way and maybe no harm, no fell that day, but in very small ways, it's chipping away at my soul and my sense of who I am. Uh, maybe it's a, maybe it's a, a, a secretary that said, I, I am, I am never going to work late on Wednesdays because my daughter play soccer and I, I promised I'd be there for her. And one day the boss says, hey, I know you said that, but tomorrow I have this big meeting. Can you stay late and help me put together my stuff? And she says, well, just this once. Chip, chip, chip. So giving in is something it's easier to recognize and it's, it's easier to turn around. Um, for the rescuer, the leading indicator is what we call giving unsolicited advice. And give... <laughs> And, and well, hold on, let advice. me tell you. <laughs> yeah. You know you're doing it when you say, let me, because let me or here, let me show you or what you need to know is. And here's something, here's something I really want listeners to pay attention to. I'm going to draw an analogy that is going to be very uncomfortable, but I want you to consider this. How is saying starting a sentence with here, let me any different than non-consensual sex? Think Whoa. about it. So – 
let's compare non-consensual helping to non-consensual sex. In both cases, I'm helping you against your will. You didn't give me permission. I'm acting like I know what's best for you, and I'm taking a maternal or paternal role as if somehow you need me to do this, and you're going to be better off if you let it happen. That's pretty scary. That's profound. That's, I mean, I think that that one's going to be, that's a bit of a slap upside the head for a lot of people, but it's a great way to grasp the, the gravity of this because, as you said earlier, the justification is... I'm trying to help. I mean, and that is I'm, what people will say. I know I've done it myself. I'm making you like, better. I'm just trying to help. Yeah. Like, why are you, why are you so making, pissed off? I'm just trying to help you. I, I try to help my daughter. Fourth grade. She. I'm, I'm washing dishes. She's at the bar working on her math homework, struggling, complaining, complaining. I was pretty good at math. I looked at what she was doing. I figured, hey, I, I can help her. I got some techniques. So I said, here, let me show you something I learned. And immediately she reacted and said, Dad, back off. You don't know anything about math. You've never been in fourth grade. Get out of my face. And I thought, you know, I felt defensive. And here's what I did. I turned on her and went persecutor. I said, fine, don't ask for my help. You can fail your test and don't come crying to me. And so when – It was a moment when, of supreme parenting. I know. I was such a good dad. But, you know – so that day I realized, you know, trying to help a fourth grader against their will is a violation of human dignity. Children and humans and adults, they want to feel capable and competent. And so giving unsolicited advice is the, is the leading aid indicator. And we could talk all day about that dynamic because in the workforce, what we have found is it is the most likely drama role that people actually promote for. They lift it up as if it's something great because you can fix all these problems. We promote you, and now you're fixing everyone else's problems except for your own. Everyone feels incompetent, and there's no innovation anymore. So what did you say that you said? Um, I'm just going to try to write a note because uh, I think it's a great line that people need to grasp. Helping without request slash permission is a violation of human dignity. It is. Wow. I mean, I really hope people write that down and get that. Um, now, I'm not talking about emergency situations. No. You know, if someone's having a heart attack, that's different. But in general life, it, it's it's very much a violation. And, and victims resent it, even if they don't say anything. Yeah, th- th- this is the this is the trap. That I think people don't get this. The trap is, it is that a victim, the person who's in that victim mentality is in a victim position, will elicit that from you, and then they resent the shit out of you for doing it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, like, they'll say something like they'll say something like, "Oh, I can't figure out how to get my um, get that thing to stop spinning on my screen." They've never asked for help, so a rescuer swoops in and says, "Here, let me show you what to do." And the victim says, "Oh, thank you. I don't know what I've done without you." And meanwhile, they're saying, "I can't believe he's all. I always feel like so worthless when I'm around him. Why does he always swoop in and fix it for me?" Yeah, it's because now I'm I'm no better off than I was before. I still can't solve my own problem. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Third role. Yeah. So the third leading indicator, how do I know I'm slipping into persecutor? We call it giving ultimatums. So there's giving in, giving unsolicited advice, and giving ultimatums. And these are not ultimatums. These are not healthy boundaries. These are, the, these are ultimatums. These are lines in the sand that are, that are going to define someone's okayness. So it might be something like, like passive-aggressively saying, you know, I don't know how many more times I can defend you in that meeting. What that is is an ultimatum saying, if you make me have to stick up for you, I'm throwing you under the bus, and it's your fault because you, you're you the bad guy. Um, or here's the classic Clint Eastwood. Go ahead. Make my day. <laughs> so he has the, the – the bad guy has the girl with the knife, and he's got the gun pointed at the guy, and he says, go ahead. Make my day. Well, that's a very convenient – little mind trick. What it means is if if you hurt her, you will pull the trigger on my, my gun that shoots you. So it's actually going to be you that killed yourself. Right. I will have no responsibility for doing this. Mm-hmm. And in a leadership position, how, how many times do bosses say, you've given me no choice but to fire you? That's horse crap. Mm-hmm. What do you mean, given me no choice? I say to the boss, stand up and own your responsibility. You chose to fire that person. You could have chosen not to. And maybe gotten fired yourself or taken the heat. But don't make it the other person's fault that you're doing your job. Yeah, you know, and it's, so it's, those it's are interesting, the – It's interesting in that when you said that because um, uh, Jack Welch, who I was never a big fan of when he was in leadership, you know, and his books on that. 
but I saw him speak at the World Business Conference in New York uh, about five, six years ago, and he's been retired for a long time. He started teaching, and he's and he's right. mellowed. His soul is mellowed, which is nice to see. He's still a pretty aggressive guy, guy when it came right, to right. certain political issues. But one of the things he talked about, which I thought was wonderful, was he talked about the generosity gene. And one of the things he said there was that nobody should ever be shocked when they're fired. And what he said around right. that was that because you as a boss have provided enough coaching and enough help and constantly said, what do you need? What do you need? How can, I, well, how can we coach you? What, what training do you need? So that that person at yeah. the end is not surprised when you, when you go, do you feel like this is working? And they say no. That's very different than I had no choice but to let you go. Um, that, and I think that that's a very interesting piece based on what you're just saying there about taking full responsibility and accountability. And actually, what's yeah. fascinating is in each one of the three positions, you don't. No. And the leading indicator is the setup for me to start giving up responsibility for my behavior. And it, it, it's such a, it, it's the beginning of the mind game we play so that we can start choosing justification over effectiveness. Let's say I'm a leader and I'm trying to get people to do do what they're supposed to do and what I want, and I'm trying to close the gap, and they're not doing it. So I'm frustrated. Well, I can deal with that gap by giving an ultimatum and making it their problem, or I can face the tough the tough reality of what could I do differently? What do I have control over to try to improve my leadership skills? And then honestly and generously and compassionately make the tough choice if I, if I choose to do that and own it. You see, but that's the piece, making that tough choice. Um, I, I'm sure you've done this too, Nate. I mean, I have had to, quote, fire clients. I've had to, you know, uh, and say that have I given everything I could? Have I examined, re-examined, thought of new ways, come at it in a different way, at tr done my best to empower that individual in any way that I possibly can? And they just... They like repeating the cycle for whatever psychological reason right. there is. Because now we're, at, we're, you know, we've gone through this and we've talked about these leading indicators and, and we've got talked about how people can catch themselves on those, the, those markers on the road that say you're, you're going off track. But there's the other side of that, which is how do we deal with it? Like, so, yes. you know, you've got the employee, you've, you've been, yep. had the generosity gene, you've done those kinds of things. You've provided every possible empowerment, skill, tool, strategy, coaching you can. And this person is now back in their cycle. They're back in their drama model. They, they, right. How do we deal with that? Well, that's where we – that's what I'm so excited about and where we're trying to really bring energy to this movement of compassionate accountability. And we, we have to look at the word compassion and really understand the meaning first. Yeah. The word compassion is not what most people think. It's not a kindness. My heart goes out to you. No. I see the starving puppies on TV, and, and, and I like the cause on Facebook or I write a check. Compassion comes from the Latin root, meaning co-suffer, yes. co-struggle. Calm is alongside. Um, that movie, The Passion of the Christ, a while, a while back with uh, Mel Gibson, he chose to film the movie through the lens of the suffering. That It was about the struggle. Uh, many ways to tell the story, but this was about the struggle. So compassion means to struggle with. Drama means to struggle against. Mm -hmm. And in the drama triangle, every role and every interaction is adversarial. There's The goal is for there to be a winner and a loser so I can feel justified. In compassion, the goal is to preserve dignity while holding each other accountable. And so co-struggling is the name of the game, and that's where we've developed what we call the compassion cycle, which is what we call the engine of compassionate accountability. And it gives a new, different way to harness conflict as a creative, innovative breakthrough source of energy rather than a destructive source of energy with casualties. That's powerful. So can you give us a glimpse inside of this new model? Because I think it's – I think it, we're desperate for it. Yeah. Well, there's there's three core competencies, and the the beauty of a core competency is you can develop it, you can build skills. You can't change your natural predilections, you can't change your personality, you can't change how you were brought up, but you can develop skills. And there's three. the The first one is openness. Openness is the healthy antidote to victim, because it's like two sides of a coin. 
victim people are too open, too vulnerable, too self-defeating, whereas open people are what we call confidently transparent. Mm -hmm. They are willing to show you who they are, not because they can guarantee that they trust you, but because they know you don't define them. And so I often ask people, what is it? What does it take for you to trust somebody? And they list all these qualities of the other person. And then I ask them, well, what about you does it take for you to trust someone? And the answer always is, well, I, I, I have to know I'm okay. And I have to stop defining my okayness based on how another person responds to me. Does it mean I care? No, of course I care about how people see me and respond to me, but it does not define me. So that willingness to be confidently transparent is the first key core competency. So that, that's, Brene that, Brown, that's, yeah. that's important because uh, um, is I care, but I'm not defined by. That's a key, like underline yeah. that, folks, as you're yeah. listening. Care, the like, mantra. Yeah, because a lot of us say, well, well, I just don't care what people think. That's bullshit. Yeah. Every one of us cares what people think. Yes. It, it, yeah. it, it hits. You know, somebody doesn't like me, it still hits. And, and I might even get knocked to the canvas. But yeah. I'm not going to stay on the canvas. I'm going to get up because it doesn't define me. I can feel yeah. like it does for five minutes, for maybe longer, whatever it is. But... I think this is yeah. that's a very important point, Nate. That I want people to really grasp, you know, particularly as you're climbing that ladder, because somebody's going to look down on you and say you're a piece of crap, and that's a punch to the gut. And it's and it's not like you go, oh well, you know, I, I did I did Nate's programs, I took Duff's trainings, whatever it is. You know, it doesn't. I don't care. Nonsense. Of course yeah. you care. Yes. But it can't define you. Vitally important. So that openness, that openness is critical, and it, it, it is the starting point for compassion accountability because without openness, there's no safety, and without safety, there's no way to do conflict that creates. So openness is a place where we get our real motives and agendas out on the table. We, we send the message to ourselves and each other. We are worthwhile. In fact, we're so worthwhile that we're willing to have conflict that creates instead of avoid it or mediate it or manage it or destroy each other. Mm -hmm. So that's the first one is openness. And we do a lot of training with people on there's three different strategies and, and they can learn those in the book. The second one is resourcefulness. And resourcefulness is the healthy, positive antidote to rescuing. Both resourceful people and rescuers are super creative problem solvers. Mm -hmm. The difference is resourceful people teach you how to fish and rescuers just give it to you and then throw you under the bus if you don't appreciate it. So re resourcefulness is about creative problem solving in a spirit of raising competence and confidence of everyone involved. I like to ask leaders, I said, when you, um, when you attempt to help somebody and intervene in a coaching or any kind of a, of a situation, when that interaction is over and that person walks away, do they feel more or less capable and confident in themselves than they did before? That's and if they question. feel more conf yeah, if they feel more capable and confident, then you've been effective. But if they see you as a hero, you've not done your job. Um, so that's resourcefulness. And but, but again, I think that's a, we have to stop for a minute because I want people to grasp that. Because walking away feeling like I was great versus walking away with they really got it. Now, I, I don't know yeah. that you can ever be certain that somebody got it, but that they feel good about themselves, that I yeah. simply facilitated them feeling good about what they're capable of yeah. versus them looking at me and thinking how wonderful I am. <clears throat> that's that's that yeah. particularly for those of us who are trained as rescuers uh, by our childhood or by our careers or both right, um, right. that's a hard one to give up <laughs> yeah, it is it is because we're trading in ego and justification for effectiveness yeah. um and it's it's so it's it's so dovetails well with people that are really into strengths-based uh, work and strengths-based focus and leveraging strengths and positive psychology, it all fits because yeah. if we really are key on leveraging strengths, then we're not just leveraging our own. <laughs> As leaders, we're leveraging other people's strengths. Very good. Um, and so so that's resourcefulness. Yes. Um, the, the next third one is persistence, and persistence is the healthy antidote to persecutor. Um, both persecutors and persistent people are not quitters. They're both not quitters. Right. The difference is is that persistent people are willing to hold hold to their boundaries, talk about what's not working, um, enforce rules, 
stand for their values, but they do it in a way that is does not demean other people. Um, it's very, very possible for me to hold a very firm boundary with my wife or my daughter or an employee without acting as if somebody's not okay or somebody's going to be hurt. Um, and so just last night we were struggling that with my daughter. My wife and I spent 30 minutes trying to craft – on a text conversation with my daughter who didn't want to come home from a date and she hadn't gotten some stuff done around the house first. So how do we do boundaries in a way that preserves dignity? And later, later, I, I want you to remind me at near the end, I, I want to go back to that situation with the computer, with the spinning thing and coming and rescuing, because there's a better way to do that. Um, and it seems so simple, but it's transformative. So persistence is the healthy antidote to persecuting. So now what we have is three core competencies, each of them is the healthy antidote. So what that means is with, within each of us, on the other side of that drama role is a wonderful potential skill set that we can develop. And these three are interdependent. They work together in a very specific way. And, and that's the machine or the, or the engine that we call the cycle of compassion. This is, this is very powerful. So let, let's take this into, let's take this into the real world, what is the most practical thing that a C-suite leader or even a, a high-level entrepreneur can do? Like, What's the most practical application of this for them? I want to give you two that go together. The mm -hmm. first one is it always starts with me. So how do I apply this internally to get right, get myself out of drama, get myself in a good space before I try to help somebody else? Yeah. And the compassion cycle works like this. Always start it open then go to resourceful, then go to persistent, and then come back to open. So what I would do with, with an executive leader would say, when you perceive a gap between what you want and what you're getting, whether it's an internal gap, whether it's an external gap, first of all, identify your emotions. How are you, what, how are you experiencing this emotionally? Because a gap creates energy, and that energy is emotional. So identify it. Second of all, identify your emotional motives. If I'm feeling scared, how do I want to feel? Well, I want to feel safe. So by the, once I've identified that, I now know every bit of energy that I, can, that I expend from this point forward is to try to feel safe, whether I say that or not. At yes. least now I know my motive. So but then I go to resourceful and I say, okay, what, do I have, what resources do I have available? Do I need to ask for help? What do I need to learn? Is there something I need to disclose and let people know about? So that's where I get creative about problem solving. But then I go to persistent and I say, okay, what choices do I have to make and what are the consequences of those choices if I'm going to achieve my emotional motive? What boundaries are at stake? What principles come into play here? What really is it about at the end of the day? And once I've consulted that, I go back to open and say, now, how do I feel? Mm, that's powerful. And it's – that helps me get right. And then the same thing, it's called the formula for compassionate conflict. And I can apply the very same thing externally when I'm having a very difficult conversation with, with, with a C-suite peer or whether I'm uh, deciding how to write an apology from Oscar Munoz to everybody that's ever flown United. Um, <laughs> it's it, His apology that he sent out to everybody last a couple of weeks ago actually exactly followed the formula for compassionate conflict with a few exceptions. I thought so it was brilliant. But, yeah, um, it's, yeah. it's fascinating. The um, for me, <clears throat> I, I I describe, and I, you know, and you, I'm totally open to your disagreeing with me and see where we go here. But for me, conflict is tension, and I don't see tension as a bad thing. If I'm objective, when I'm in it, when I'm when it's subjective, it can feel like a bad thing. But objectively, it's it's just tension, yeah. and. If you are feeling an internal conflict with another person, there's a tension there within you that now makes you yeah, yeah. not as available, not as open, not as communicative, all those things with the other person because of that tension. <clears throat> and so this is, I think, where one of the great failings of communication is, is, well, how do I release the tension? Well, what most often happens is we triangulate. So we go from, I'm upset with Fred, so I'll go talk to Bob. And I'll bitch, moan, complain, gossip about Fred to Bob, and I feel right. a little bit better. Now, Bob, on the other yeah. hand, feels like I emotionally vomited on him. He's not feeling so great. And there's no change over here with Fred, who I have the original issue with. And so next time I come up against it, it will respur again and come back, to, come back yeah. and probably magnify again. And so right. one of the things that, that I'm 
adamant about in the work that we do around communication is you have to ban triangulation. You have to ban releasing the pressure, releasing the tension. And I say, if you want to release the tension, there's only one place you can do it, except with the other person, and that's in your journal. Write it out. Right. Write it right. out. Get some of the tension out so you, can, so you can, quote, calm down. You can ground yourself a little more. But this is something we, I think it's systemic. I think it's societal. You know, I see that. People are going to go and talk to somebody else rather than talking direct. And I get it. I understand the tension. Yeah. How do you guys deal with that, you know, in your work? Because I'm certain yeah. that you deal with that head on. Well, I want to start by reacting to your – you asked me to agree or disagree with this notion of tension. And uh, just yesterday I was talking to a brand strategist for a, a big New York branding agency, and she was talking about how – this notion of if you set a brand up to be the rescuer for the victim consumer, it's a very, very dicey proposition. And sure. so she's using this in branding. But she also talked about com tension and that we use – the tension is really important for innovation and for Absolutely. creativity. Yep. Um, I, so I do agree with you in, in, in principle. And I would say let's just look at an electrician if you want to understand the, the difference between drama and compassion mm -hmm. or how you use energy. I'm in awe of electricians. They work around this incredibly potentially dangerous energy source, and they don't get hurt. But if you short out electricity, all kinds of damages happen. And I think gossip and triangulation is like shorting, yeah. where there's sparks everywhere. Energy is being used destructively to burn and melt stuff. At the same time, we can channel that to power incredible things. So as far as I'm concerned, here's what gossip is. It's called Gossip is when we are seeking drama allies. Very and the good. only thing we – that's all it is, is when I'm, I'm looking for a drama ally and I go look for somebody who will, who will agree with my self-justified position. So victims go look for other victims to say, oh, you know, see how bad we have it. I can't believe Joe treated you like that in the meeting. I know, right? Or the persecutors get together and they say, I, I, had, to, I had to fire him, right? Oh, yeah, you had no choice. If he, if he kept acting like that, he would have taken the organization down. The rescuers get together and gossip about how smart they are, and if people would just listen to them, we wouldn't have all these problems. But people don't go gossip with somebody that has a different role because that becomes them a drama adversary, and that's a whole different thing. So the way to stop drama is we talk about people's how do you craft a response to say basically we can waste our energy this way or we can use it effectively like you're talking about. So I think we're on the same page. Yeah, that's it's that's really great. I mean, you're right. We don't gossip with people who disagree. Yeah. Oh <laughs> like, no, we'll go find I someone find else. Who agree with me? Yeah, we'll, we'll go pat find me on someone the back else and rub my ego. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll go complain to them because I know that exactly. they're on my side. So, and, so our biggest phrase now in America, maybe this is big in Canada, wherever you work. Here's the number one self-justifying gossip phrase. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> He was such a jerk. He unliked me on Facebook. I know, right? And so it's basically saying we're agreeing to be in drama together and not be effective. But, you know, I, again, um, this, this is now where in people's minds who are not familiar with this, it becomes about conflict in the old model. So if I don't yep. agree with you, now we are in conflict. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, I can, you know, which is what you're talking about, this compassionate response, which is, I can see your point. I can see where you're coming from. I can get yeah. that. However, is there another way to look at this? Yep. However, well, uh, is there a yeah. way to do this without drama? Right. And uh, can I share an example of how Please. we would use this tension creatively? So. Mm. This formula, we call it the formula for compassionate conflict, and it is when we perceive a gap or when we're dealing with drama, we craft a response that is open, resourceful, persistent, and open, O-R-P-O. -O. So very simple. Let's take the situation with uh, my colleague sitting next to me, her computer spinning. She can't figure it out. She's complaining, and I have this urge to go rescue, but instead, I start to open and I say, oh, man, I empathize. It's like, man, I, I hate that when it happens. You're trying to get work done and it's getting in your way. I, I hear you. Then we go to resourceful and we be a resource without rescuing. And I might say something like, hey, I've had that happen before and, and I've figured out a couple ways. I'm happy to share if you want it. Then we go to persistent and we reinforce the commitments and we say, I'm here for you if you need me. And then we go back to O and we say, um, I care about 
I care about you having a great day. Mm -hmm. So here's what it sounds like. I look over, I hear the person complaining and I say, oh man, I hate it when that happens. Um, I've discovered some tricks I'm happy to share with you if you want. I'm committed to supporting you in whatever way is best. I'm here for you. And what I've done is I, assuming that person is in one of the three roles of drama, I've built four bridges. Mm -hmm. They can come on and open. They can leave the victim and come on open and own their potency and ask for help. Mm -hmm. They could come on at resourcefulness and say, I'm not going to be saved. I can step up and engage the resources around me. They could come on at persistent and simply say, thank you so much for being here for me. I'll let you know if I want help. So they agree that we have a commitment to each other. Or they could simply come back on open and say, oh, I know, right? It, mm -hmm. it, it sucks. And, and they're like, oh, you're with me in my suffering, but I didn't ask you to fix anything. Um, and so that's a super simple example where we can violate dignity or we can clarify com compassion accountability in that's every fabulous. single interaction. It's fabulous. Um, and again, I think that I think that each one of us watching, listening, needs to pay attention to the fact that to take some personal accountability in the these three dominant roles are there societally. So if you go, well, I'm not one of those. You know what? You're probably lying to yourself. We're all oh, yeah. we're all moving into those roles. And and here's the other thing I would like to say, and this is one of the things that I teach. And you, again, you might not agree with it, but. For me, it's very simple. If you're doing one, you're doing all three. You're doing them in some way, shape, or form. You're playing out all three. You may have a dominant, but you're playing all three. And so what I love about what you're saying here, Nate, is that you certainly pay attention to your dominant, but recognize how you'll sneak into the other roles as yeah. well. And yeah. that gives you a, a level of self-awareness and self-accountability that is so unfamiliar for so, for so many people right. because right. – if you have a dominant, as you said, you're going to look for other people to justify that you are a persecutor, that you're the victim, that you're the rescuer. Right. But if you go, hold on a second, I am each one of these. One of them yeah. is dominant in me, but you know, but I definitely can play every one of those. Yeah. Then I need a, a level of self awareness. You know, I get frustrated with people around emotional intelligence because I don't think people really grasp it because the the depth of emotional intelligence is self-knowledge and self-awareness. Right. Before it's yeah, done yeah, anything yeah. to do with anybody else, yeah. you know this better than anybody. And, and pulling people yeah, back yeah, yeah, to, yeah. To, to saying, well, I'm emotionally intelligent because I can see that person's playing victim. Bullshit. Can you see you're playing victim? Yeah, right. Can you see you're playing persecutor? Can you see that you're playing rescuer? Well, I'm not. Well, then you're not that emotionally yep. intelligent. Yeah. <laughs> right? Well, I'm glad you brought that up because – uh, one of them is is well we've developed an assessment for this so you you can go any of the listeners can go uh, in if they get the book there's a code in the book where you can go take what's called our drama resilience assessment and you can find out how frequently in a given day do you play each of the three roles and how strong and and resilient are your compassion skills and then it gives you what's called a drama resilience index and so we can see this so it's possible to assess it you can get feedback on that. Um, and then also, we, we do a lot of work around personality, communication, and structure. And what we've discovered, which is fascinating, is personality structure predicts almost 100% which roles we'll play under what conditions at each level of distress. And so it's like – it's so predictable that, like you said, is true. It's like nobody's immune. We all play these. We go back and forth. I know I play the rescuer more at work. Because maybe my role would, would beg that of me and invite sure. me to do that. Whereas at home, I play the victim more because I just want to be a great dad and I don't want my kids to hate me. And, and, and my girls are going to leave home in a few months. you know. So, so I play roles all over the place. And then when I'm mowing my lawn in my head, I'm persecuting everyone all day that ever said anything to me that I don't like. <laughs> but I, but I, that's what I love about you, Nate. I mean you and I have that yeah. in common. It's like one of the things about the rescuer – is the bottom line is, and I say this to people all the time, bottom line is I'm just better than you. Yeah. I know better than you. Oh, yeah. I'm better than you. But the ownership of, hold on a second, I can play any of these roles is, you know what? I'm no better than you. I can right. play right. the rescuer here. I can play the persecutor there. I can sure as hell play the victim there. Yeah, I have a dominant because of training or childhood or whatever it might be. However, I can step into all three roles. And I, and I love what you said is that People say, well, I'm just not like that. And I go, well, what about when you're around your kids? 
Oh, yeah, well, yeah. I am. Well, what about when you're around the office? <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, you know, there's always a place that oh. will, that will, <laughs> yeah. that will stroke you into that position in depending on the environment. And that's, that's what a lot of ownership. <laughs> One of the greatest examples of this, I, I, you would have laughed. After a, after a presentation, I'd done about an hour talk on this, and, and I was doing a book signing, and people were coming up to thank you, and this was great. And we have these stickers. Here, here, here my no drama sticker. I have it on my phone because Fabulous. this is where all the drama happens. So this woman came up after the presentation. She grabbed a bunch of no drama stickers, and she said – Announced to everyone, she says, I'm putting this on my office door because I don't do drama, and my area is a drama-free zone. And it was like everyone around immediately realized you are the cause of the drama. And nobody <laughs> said anything, but you know, that level that 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 whole attitude of I'm just gonna create a zero tolerance policy for drama. Well, what are you gonna do with the energy and the tension then? Exactly. And so it was kind of funny. We we were all kind, but it's kind of you know we hear that once in a while. Yeah. So th this yeah. is great, and we're getting close to the end. I want to ask you a couple of more personal questions, if I may. Sure. Yeah. What belief have you had to overcome in order to reach? I mean, you know, you're you're working as you've got your fabulous map behind you of all the people, all the countries that you serve. What what is a belief that you had to overcome personally in order to reach the level of success that you're at? It's the 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 most um, I think the hardest belief for me, having been a psychologist, trained as a rescuer, started a company as a consultant, the hardest belief for me to overcome is it's possible for me to help somebody without being the center of attention. And it's and, and there's many ramifications to that because our our company, we're trying to create a global network of trainers where we provide them with great engineered curriculum, great assessments, fabulous support and coaching, and they get to go out and change the world. And so we're working behind the scenes supporting them and coaching them and trying to create curriculum that is so good that anyone could pick it up and go change a relationship tomorrow. And nobody gets the credit except for the person that read that thing and made the choice. And so that belief system to let go of a great idea, let go of something that's powerful and make it accessible to the whole world um, without being the person that delivered it is is the belief I had to let go of and, and get through to be able to. Yeah, I, I really get that. <laughs> Maybe a little too well. I get that. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, I love to be a trainer. I love it when people say, oh, this is the greatest thing ever. Love this model. Oh, you changed my life. I'm like, I don't want to be the one that changed your life. Yeah. I want you to be the one that changes your life. Yeah. One of my great teachers, Patasareje, gave me a mantra many, many years ago, and he said, Om Satguru. And I, of course, I didn't know what that meant. Um, and, and I asked him, and he wouldn't tell me. <clears throat> and so I looked at the words and did the research, but I couldn't find out what it really meant. And it's be your own master, you know, because I was making him the guru and he was mm. like, no, no, mm. um, sat guru. be your yeah. own master. Yeah. And it's not yeah. arrogance. It's not any of that. It's the, because uh, in um, sat guru, I'm always willing to learn. I'm always willing to yeah. grow. It's not that I'm the master and I don't need anything else, but right. I'm also not willing to ha to pedestalize or be pedestalized and, because there's no connection. My right. analogy is if somebody's on a pedestal, you've got to tear them down to get eye to eye. Right? Or I've got to tear you down to get eye to eye, you know, and I, yeah. I, I, I don't want that. That's not real relationship. Yeah. Uh, we're getting very, very close to the end. I want to ask you this. If you only get to have one thing on your gravestone, just that short piece, what do you want it to say? Here's what I wanted to say. I wanted to say hashtag start at open. <laughs> I love that. Because, because that's my that's my weakness on the compassion cycle. And it's it's been it's been the thing that I'm working the hardest on and getting coaching from my team on. I'm really good at resourceful and persistent. Being open is the hardest thing for me. And so that's been my growth curve. And we've developed this hashtag started open to start tracking research and information to show the value of that. So if if I was if I was known by my family and my friends as somebody that could do openness well, I could die. That's fantastic, Nate. This has been extraordinary. I I have 
absolutely loved this conversation. I think it's vitally important. I'm going to encourage everybody to get out there and get this book. Please tell our viewers, our listeners, where they can find out more about you, about all the incredible resources that you have, about potentially becoming a trainer, uh, uh, potentially bringing you in to speak, whatever it may be. Great. Well, the, the first – thank you. Thank you. The, the first thing is to go to our website. It's next-element.com. And on that page, you you can learn about my new book, and it's available. You can get to it through our website. It's available on Amazon and all the major booksellers. Um, and there's a media and a speaking link on my page where you can learn about bringing me in as a speaker. I love to do keynotes, and I'm on a kind of a speaking tour now for my book. Cool. And the Or you can just call our office and ask for me. And uh, I love to have personal conversations. And even if it takes a while for me to get back, uh, email is fine as well. Fabulous. Well, you know what? It, as I said, it's been really awesome. Um, this, I, I know there's so much for all of us to learn from you, and I really want to thank you for your your contribution to to the world in the way that you're doing it. I think it's vitally important, and I'm, I'm really happy and honored to have you on the show. So thank you, Nate. You are so welcome, Dov, and I really appreciate uh, your your belief in this, your friendship, and all of the things we have in common. It's wonderful. Thank you, sir. And, and to you, dear listener, dear viewer, I want to remind you that the research consistently shows that the biggest challenges facing some of the most successful companies can be so counterintuitive is that the fastest growing companies often hit a point where they realize that they're spending an absolute fortune on training and attracting and developing talent. And they're also learning, losing that talent at an alarming rate. If you are sick of investing in training and development for your talent, only to have them leave you before you've got an ROI, then come and visit us at fullmontyleadership.com, where we provide the essential leadership skills to rekindle and amplify the hidden loyalty assets of your organization. With our assistance, you can reduce employee turnover rate by as much as 80% in as little as 120 days thus evaporating those horrendous costs. So fullmontyleadership.com, providing you with the concrete soft skills that, to get you from where you are to the top and keep you there because you cannot outsource authenticity. Please remember to stop by matrix.fullmontyleadership.com and get your authentic leadership matrix self-assessment tool it's 197 dollar value you get it for free for being one of our listeners matrix like the movie dot full monty leadership.com till next time this is dov baron full monty leadership.com saying stay curious my friend stay curious how you are part of the drama triangle till next time this is dov and i'm out